intelligent. Are we there yet? We're ready to go. We want to welcome you who are streaming live in today, reminding you that we have a handout of 1 Peter 3 highlights. Also, you'll have to get for yourself a 3 by 5 card where we are trying to learn a verse from each chapter of Peter in our discipleship for Christ. Now, I noticed in the last two weeks that the index cards don't seem to be going as fast as the first week. So if some of you are kind of saying, eh, I ain't going to bother with that, just let me remind you, when you read something, you retain about 30 to 40 percent of it, unless you have a photo recall mind like I do. I don't have a photographic memory. I have a memory that can tell you which side of the page or how far into a book something is. I had a seminary professor that could tell you, go upstairs and in the fourth row there's a little red book between two blue ones and on page 18 in the third paragraph to the left. He knew this stuff. You don't need to have this. You just have to say, I write my verse. When you read and then write something, you retain about 60% of what you have gotten. When you write and read, I mean, when you read and then write and then you repeat aloud what you have, almost 80 to 90% of your learning is retained. You know it'll be there. It'll come back. It'll be the kind of thing that Jesus said, I will give you when you ask me what you need to know that I have told you. So I want to encourage you again today, just for one minute, we're just going to do, if you'll find somebody to share your verse with, let's do just the one from 1 Peter 3 today. You're still responsible for the first and second, but because of our Easter timing and the folks, if you're streaming and need to print out the highlight sheet, do it now, and we'll be back to you in a minute. Uh, go ahead, get, get together here, uh, share the verse, show each other the card. If you copied it wrong and say it wrong, how can they know it? But it's at least word perfect to what you have. For you who are streaming in, my verse today was 1 Peter 3.18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. 1 Peter 3.18. Not hard, just requiring this. And remember, I'm reading this in three versions every week and trying to keep my brain straight. So. <laughs> All right, you got one for me there. All right, Ma, that was a quiet recitation, but good for you. For all of you who are streaming in, as well as you who are here, I want to point out that for 1 Peter 3, if you have to give a devotional or someday you're reading and somebody says, what's in 1 Peter 3? Here's a fair outline that'll tell you what's in this chapter. From verses 1 to 12, it deals with the matter of submission or subjection on the old King James. Subst uh, supremacy. You overcome the way the world handles stuff and have a reason for honoring Christ in your heart and the substitution of Jesus' life and death for ours. So, as we begin this week, I want everybody to stand up for a moment, if you will. Will you all stand up, please? Now, I know I said that at the beginning of every every class that we get an opportunity to ask questions but trying to save my microphone guy if you had trouble reading first peter three this week anywhere from the end about baptism the ark the water if you had problems with that and understanding sit down 
Nobody had problems with it? Okay. How about one to three? Of the, how many of the women had problems with verses one to six on being subject? Yeah, okay, boom, there they go. And uh, so the rest of you had understanding. Okay, everybody look and see if you have any question about the passage. Look to these folks. <laughs> This is a t- it's probably the most bustle- baffling chapter in the New Testament as we come here, but what a great time on Easter, resurrection morning. For Christ is risen, it's the hope of 1 Peter's letter. Uh, and as we come here, we want to start with dealing with what Peter has to say. And the first thing he says is in chapter 3, verse 1, likewise. Likewise? What's likewise? Well, just like before. Oh, well, what was before? And we have to go all the way back to 1 Peter 2, talking about our public behavior, which was the theme of last week's lesson, and how we conduct ourselves before people who are in authority, how we deal with people who are over us as employers or maybe slave owners or people to whom we're indentured, And then it comes down to wives, then it comes down likewise husbands, and then down to verse 8, all of you. And this will come up again. This is a theme that is in Peter. It's not just something marked out. I want to remind you that when it speaks about being an honor to the governor or to be subject to the authorities over you, the Lutheran Christians of Germany had a problem with this in the Third Reich, and folks such as Dietrich Bonhoeffer were able to say what the difference was scripturally, although their answer to how to deal with it was a little different. We also have in the United States the writings of Francis Schaeffer in his later years, reminding us that civil disobedience from a Christian may be called on if the king who is all-powerful to do good and to punish bad ends up doing all bad and punishing good, and it changes the circumstance of the Christian in his obedience, because it's supposed to be as one following the Lord Christ. And when our mores begin to say, "Uh uh-oh, it's different, then we say we serve the Lord Christ. Now, I want to come to this one where I'm asking all you who are especially uh, streaming in from the left wing of the feminist movement, please stay seated until you get to the end of this so I don't hear all the chairs scuffling and everybody walking out. Likewise, verse 1, wives, be subject to your husbands. Oh, uh, mm, oh, and people just sweat and they groan. First of all, this does not say to men, your wives are doormats. This is a misunderstanding of being in submission. It's also very clear through all the other likewises that it all follows the same type of pattern. But in the Greek, submission, which means just, you know, have no will and just do whatever is said, really means willingly adapt. Now I want to talk about this as a Christian marriage for you who are outside the pale of Christ or are interested at least in Christianity, when two Christians come to marry, you have two forgiven sinners, but not two former sinners, who were saying, I pledge myself to you for the rest of my life, I pledge myself to you for the rest of my life, and that whether in good or bad, plenty or lack, sickness or health, I stick with you to the end of our days till God says it's the end. And in that case, you still have the two forgiven sinners who are still sinners that have to keep short accounts with God and each other. And often what happens is because of the nature of our sin and the fact that me first, got to protect my rights. I'm going to be trampled under. All the things that say I, I, I am am being defrauded. And I'm not discounting this. I served 23 years as a pastor, dealt with some of the most tearful situations of men abusing their wives who on Sundays looked really good, but it was not great. But what does Peter say here? Likewise, wives, just like those who were out there under indenture or slavery, those who are under emperors, even though King Jesus is the Lord and kingdom they belong to, 
so you also be willingly adapting, saying, you know, when it comes down to it, the way God sets things up, according to Ephesians 5, 22, that marriage is like this. The husband is to be as Christ to his wife. Christ who cares for the church, gives himself sacrificially for it, is willing to lay down his life for her. To that end, that's what marriage is represented by the groom. The bride is supposed to be as the church, who is obedient to her husband, waiting to be clothed and presented to God, faultless before the throne. It's a, Count Zinzendorf was the one who wrote Jesus by blood and righteousness, and actually what it says, my beauty is my glorious dress. Most of us sing that and think, yeah, it's something we put on. Uh, the actual word in the German is my wedding dress. And he's talking about the fact that we who are the body of Christ are the bride of Christ. And that the one thing that I have in all my regal splendor is I, I'm coming to God in, in a wedding dress that's pure and white because of Christ Jesus. He is my righteousness. This is great. And this is where, in a sense, when it comes to marriage, <clears throat> I'd have to say the way the church is to Jesus in these days, probably wives can better get along because if they're like the culture, we're going to find a lot of chaos and rebellion and hardship. The hardest thing for me and forever, any of you think not your toes are being stepped on, but the one thing that used to perplex me as a kid was that if people said Jesus is Lord, and even though you and I aren't getting along, and you and I found out after we got married that your likes are not my likes, et cetera, et cetera, you know, we're just not compatible. Go away. My brother-in-law and my youngest sister are compatible. They have no place for Christ in their life, I'm sad to say at this moment. They live their life because you know why they're compatible? My brother-in-law wants all these particular things. That's what my sister likes, too. Oh, so everything that they agree on is because it's something they want anyway for themselves. It's the most happy, compatible thing. You say, wow, that's a real Christian marriage, and it isn't. And there are others of us who are in Christ who have found that, yes, I don't know how to deal with the problem of, of not having agreement. But what Peter is saying, as far as the wife is concerned, in the pattern of Christ in marriage, the fact is that it's a willing spirit of saying, all right, you know what, at the end of things, my husband's going to have to pay the buck. He's going to have to face Christ at the judgment seat, second 2 Corinthians 5.10, we all must appear, we who are in Christ, before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the great white throne where it's you're either in heaven or out. It's, what do you do with your life after you started following me? And it's in this situation in which I think you're wrong. And I'll tell you why, my husband. But because of Christ, I'm willing to defer. I think this is going to be a great car wreck. However, I did promise in good and bad that I would stick with you. I don't want to be hurt. Most men don't care to have their wives or their families or their children messed up. They don't make wild decisions. Some do when they're out of their minds, but on the whole, most men are concerned about protecting, keeping, despite the way it may physically look when they're bashing. Willingly adapt, so I will bend to your will. And notice what Peter says, let it be that your deportment, you know, beauty may be only skin deep, but Peter says beauty is soul deep. And in your response to your husband, in terms of respect, I remember in Pittsburgh, there were men who were steel executives and had problems with alcohol, were meeting in Christian groups, trying to get back on track. And the guy that was the head of J and L Steel one time confessed, you know, I say something and 5,000 employees jump to my command. I walk around work and people almost bow down to me, but at home I can't get my 16-year-old son to have any respect for me. 
That was because the son was seeing the way he was treating the mother, his, the guy's wife. So you want to be careful about the fact that if a wife is in this situation, she is without probability uh, in peril some way. Notice why, why Peter says, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart and the beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, for this is how the holy women of the past submitted to their own husbands. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. I can't tell you that you won't have problems if you submit to your husband and he has a wrong choice. I can't tell you that your car won't crash. But remember the future is one day at a time and one hour at a time. And rebuilding and resilience is a gift God has given the human spirit, whether Christian or not. And the fact is that all is not lost. All you scientists, you know in physics, matter is neither created nor destroyed, it's just rearranged. Well, guess what? If everything belongs to God, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and everything is his, he hasn't lost anything. So whatever was your loss, he knows where it is and, and what's happening. And he will deal with this. He will. Peter assures us. Don't give way to the fear, even though you may have a certain inner scaredness because you've known your husband to make bad mistakes before. Now, it's also, it says, likewise, husbands, you to treat your wife with understanding. I know there are plenty of guys who've been married as long as I have, 55 years, and can still say, you know, I just don't understand my wife. <laughs> And I don't know why that is, but, you know, honey, I know you changed your mind. Can't you change your mind? Yeah, but you've done it seven times in the last hour. So there are times in which we will find ourselves that there is a difference between the sexes, no matter how much the unibody kind of life is. The fact is, it says your husbands with understanding know that your wife and her way of choices is based a lot on the feelings or the sense of character. It's not based on principles. Men are men of issues and principles. And I don't know how many times in presbytery meetings of denominations that have women elders, in which I've been there, and these two guys are fussing with each other at the microphones, and yeah, but, but and the bum, 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 and, and then, okay, we're going to take a break for lunch and come back and let's try to have cooler heads. And a woman will walk in the dining hall and hear the two guys that are fussing, sitting, eating lunch together. How can they do that? Because they see the character and they think, well, those guys should be enemies. They shouldn't talk to each other. They shouldn't eat together. But guys are dealing with the issues. And sometimes women just say, huh? It's the way that we are built that way. Now, I want to notice also that... Uh, I think the plain people of Lancaster County one time took the fact when it says in 1 Peter 3, don't let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold, with the intent that don't let this be your beauty only, but let what's inside you in Christ show. Now, <clears throat> I want to remind you that submission also does not mean manipulation. <laughs> In the South, there are a number of congregations and there are women that used to really shock me who would teach their daughters, you know what, honey? You want some from your husband? You don't want to give it to you? Well, let him have what he wants from you. And then when he's all worn out, you know, just ask for the favor and you'll get it. In the same way, Peter's saying, look, don't snazz up and dress up in a way externally so that you can be provocative in your dress or in a way that excites your husband and makes them say, sure, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. That's manipulation. Jesus Christ calls us to live an honest life. Remember last week that as we come to Christ, we're going to quit deceptive ways. And so for all you Southern Bells who have just gotten up and left, if anybody's left, just tell them, come back and don't be so upset. But think about what you do with yourself. So, husbands, you live with understanding of your wife. 
and you honor her. Now, a lot of us think, well, yeah, I honor her every, every time we have a birthday or an anniversary. Of course, there's some guys that don't remember when that is, so that's more difficult. Or at a Easter time, I send a card, or Christmas time, I give a gift. That's not necessarily honoring. It's, notice what Peter says we're to honor. Honor her status. And of course, some women, especially the sportswomen, don't like the idea of the weaker vessel. This doesn't say incapable. It doesn't say that different roles are of different, lesser values. It says that you have some ideas that a man on the whole may be stronger in brute force, especially if he gets mad. You may recognize there are things, you know, the issue right now with the sports is let's let guys who want to be girls now get on the girls' softball team, but you know their body mass is going to hit that ball harder or they're going to have a certain stamina that will probably show up clearly to be more of a male nature than it is a female nature. The fact is, because we were born with the differences doesn't mean there's inferiority, superiority, which is what submission had meant in the past. Wife, Bible says you're to be subject to me, so you do whatever I tell you. That's not what it says. It says live with understanding. Notice the way they think. So that ultimately your prayers are unhindered. Notice that, prayers unhindered. If you, under, I'm so excited, Un, <laughs> unhindered. If you've been in marriage and praying, Lord, you know, I, I'm not getting along, we're, we're trying to do something, but it's just not working out. Is it because of the way you're treating your wife? Are you praying and realizing that your prayers seem to be hitting the ceiling or dropping from the sky? They don't get up to God? That's what Peter's talking about here. Are you, are you careful about how you and your wife are treating? Because ultimately it said, don't let your prayers be unhindered. Don't let your prayers be hindered because of this behavior. The fact is, both of you are heirs of the grace of life. As Francis Schaeffer pointed out in one of his writings, in one sense, all male and female are part of the body of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ, so there's a feminine side, in a sense, to us that way. In the same way, my wife, who comes geographically different from where I grew up, but has come to love Lancaster County, is a sister of mine as well, a sister in Christ. And so it's very awkward at times. Now, I was the oldest of five in my family, so it's easy to treat my wife like my youngest sister, but that's not necessarily the right way to do things at times when I think that's the way it ought to be. She is in Christ with me, both sister and in herself, an heir of the grace of Jesus. And this is what I'm looking for. I think the key to this, as you see in verse 8, likewise, all of you be of one mind. We are looking for unity, not uniformity. And this is a problem that men have with assuming that, unless you think and agree to everything like I have, we, we just can't get this on right. You know, come on, wife, let's get with it. You know, I've told you my reasons. And you say, yes, but. You're always so... No, no, honey, I'm trying to say, from where I see it, because I'm a different camera, have a different lens on this, this is what I see. And it's something that I don't think you've seen before, but I'm just asking you to think. To the point that we can get and say, okay, when it gets down to the final, we got to do it, we haven't agreed on what's the method or where's the place or so on, I defer to you, my husband, for this. And the husband better be coming on his knees to the Lord saying, Father, 
let my decision be what you want it to be. If it isn't, then there's going to be great ruin and sadness all around. So that's what Peter's trying to tell us. There can be a Christian life and marriage. You can have differences. More and more, I think men find too through the years, as you understand the differences, you begin to think, you know, my wife's coming along really well in these later years, when in fact she's going around, you know that bullheaded husband of mine? <laughs> He, he finally gets the idea. Or he, he's a little more patient about that. Or he was willing to listen to me. I want to make sure that he's not doing anything on <laughs> the side. Okay, you get this sense that I'm trying to tell you as Peter comes and says, likewise, everyone in Christ, your private life, like your public life in chapter 2, is a matter of being able to say, I willingly bow to the will of Jesus. I willingly bow to the order of matters. I, as a husband, ultimately must account for my decisions of my family or my marriage to Jesus Christ. A wife can say, Lord, you told me to do this and I willingly submitted my will, even if I had doubts, but I made myself known. And I'm trusting you because you said, don't be afraid of anything that you'll get us through the future. I can't tell you what will happen if you do this constantly, other than the fact that it'll be a practice that you have peace with God in your heart, even if you have turmoil about understanding with each other physically, or that is face to face. Okay, now, for all of you who might have come back in after this deal on submission, let's look at the next section, which is 13, what I call supremacy, where it speaks here about every one of us expects in life a fair deal. In Lancaster County, it used to be that you could trust the man and his word. My grandfather, as I mentioned, was a non-church man, but I remember several times down on the streets of Lancaster by the old Hotel Brunswick when a man would come up to him and they'd talk about some deal in anthracite coal and they would shake hands on it, and my grandfather, rascal that he was, nevertheless kept the bargain, kept his word. He learned that from his Quaker father. Nowadays, it's almost difficult to understand what's going on, because in, as verses 13 and 14 seem to indicate, we normally expect if we do a right thing, everything will be all right, and there'll be quiet, and there'll be gentleness, and there'll be Life will just go along well. But we often have found more and more, and maybe it's my prejudice against outlanders, says the old Germans, the Auslanders, who come in here with a different ethos. We love Lancaster County. We love its rural way. And you know what we really loved when we looked from the bus windows back on our tour? How people took care of one another. I'm coming to Lancaster because they're going to take care of me even though I bring my boom box and ruin the idea of the 50-foot noise, and I come along with all the other things, my roaring motorcycle or my loud parties in the back, you know, because <clears throat> I want it. And who are they to tell me? And how many times every year do we see in the newspaper somebody in West Lampeter Township, somebody over in East Lampeter Township, I want to sue my neighbors because they're farmers and the stink bothers little Dickie's nose and he doesn't like the smell of it. So let's rezone. No care about the farm or the farmers? What about that bus tour you took? Oh, well, I'm here now. I'm in. Let's put him out. We expect good treatment. But as verse 14 says, but even if we don't, there's a supremacy we can have by not reacting and responding like they do to them the same manner. But rather, notice as Christ was the Lord. And the verse that Don was sharing with me this morning from 1, Corinthians, uh, 1 Peter 3, 15. Set apart the Lord God. This is what I call the supremacy. I used in your outline, verse 15, secure secure Jehovah God in your heart. What's that mean? It means 
I set God as the one to whom every time I think about doing something, I must answer to him for. You heard me tease before about the news guy that said to Joe Biden on his inauguration, well, what are your first 10 priorities, Joe, for your administration? And I'm thinking, priority means one, first above all others. You only have one priority. Everything else is a derivative. So get it straight. My priority, secure, sanctify, set apart Jesus in your heart as the one who's going to direct your life. And be ready always to give an answer to anyone that says, why are you this way? Why are you so nice? Why are you doing this for me? Why aren't you joining the crowd and, and coming along, you know, to the pub crawl if that's out of your realm of social doing? The point is, you have an answer in your heart that you answer with respect. Well, I'm a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. He lives. That's what Easter was just all about that we celebrated. He's alive from the dead. He's coming again someday, and I'm going to have to see him face to face and account for the way I spent my life. So you secure Jehovah in your heart. Now, I want you to note, if you will, just on your paper there and secure Jehovah in your heart, that this is an allusion from Isaiah 8.13. So you can look up Isaiah 8.13 later, where it will tell you, it is Jehovah of hosts whom you should regard as holy. Do you see what Peter's doing? He's equating Jesus with Jehovah God, which is always what Lord Jesus meant. Unfortunately, in the New Testament Greek, Lord could mean master, head, or it was also translated from the Hebrew as Jehovah God. And basically, the early Christian creed, Jesus is Jehovah, or Jesus is the deity, was because of this verse. Sanctify Jehovah God in your hearts. Sanctify Christ in your heart. Christ is Jehovah himself, the Son of God as we know him in his personage. So as you're there in verse 15, secure Jehovah in your heart. Lord, always help me to be ready to answer why I trust you, but also help me today to live for you again and not get distracted by all the things our culture and TV and radio, the constant noise in the background. It is tough to find a place that's quiet. Even libraries have become sort of semi-marketplaces. Of course, a lot of us are afraid to be alone with our thoughts. And that is something that should tell you why. And you need to do something about it so that you can meet Christ in your heart. Well, now we come to the third area that deals with substitution. 1 Peter 3.18 tells us that Christ suffered for sins. Hopox, this is my favorite word, and I think it was R.C. Sproul's favorite word too in the Greek. We loved this and we used to throw it back and forth. Uh, for you who aren't big on the classics, sorry about this but you'll just have to bear with us eggheads. Ah, that's not very clear. Let's be clear. Alpha, ah, ha, ha. The hard breathing, ha pox. Ha pox, which you would pronounce ha. Box. <laughs> this word means once for all. You write it down there. Once for all. Once for all time. Once for all payment. Once for all occasion. Once for all. This is why I was a little disappointed to see the ESV said, for Christ also has suffered once for sin. That sounds like, oh yeah, once upon a time Jesus died for, for people. No, it's saying... Christ died once for all. He doesn't have to do it again. Nobody else has to pay the penalty of their sin if they're in Him. 
hapax, once for all. And this great word is all over the New Testament. Romans 6 and 10. See if I can find that quickly. Um, For the death that Jesus died, he died to sin once for all, hapax. He died once for all. But the life he lives, he continues on living to God. That's Romans 6.10. You find that also in the book of Hebrews many times. Hebrews 7, 20, let's see, where is it? Hebrews 7, 27. This verse tells us that Jesus has no need, like the high priests of the Old Testament, to offer sacrifices every day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Since he did this hopox once for all, once for all time, when he offered him himself. Again in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26. Hebrews 9, 26. Tells us, as it is, Jesus has appeared hopox once for all time at the end of the ages. You know, you and I, there's no extra plan B or C coming on. And I'm sure many times when you may feel that, am I playing a mental game about Christianity? It's been 2,000 years and Jesus hasn't done anything. But Peter was convinced. Paul was convinced. We're at the end of the ages. Jesus taught us. Notice what Scripture says. At the end of the age, God will come and judge. And we can go back maybe 2,000 years. Most of us can't go back past 1,200 to find our ancestors. So there are 1,200 years even beyond that. But the fact is, going back to 1,200 is about 11, 12 generations, depending on how long people live. So in one sense, you could say, well, you know, since Jesus came and died, well, you know, maybe it's only been 25 generations. Is that, is that really many in the span of eternity? Well, it said that God is not willing any should perish. We'll learn that later. But in Hebrews 9.26, we read this. As it is, Christ appeared at the end of the ages. So we're at the end. There's no other reality that's going to happen even after we die or our grandchildren we think are going to live and die and everything's going to be the same. It's not. Once for all time, Jesus came. And in Hebrews 9.28, the same Hebrews, we read this. So Christ, having been offered up once for all time, hapax, to bear the sins of the many, his elect people, will appear a second time, no longer to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. Isn't that great? Every day we could be eagerly awaiting Christ. Every time I get up in the morning, I when I have a better mind, I think of that little book, uh, that song about Noah, about the animals that came on board, two by two, we, two, we, animals that came aboard, two by two, we, two, we, elephants and kangaroo, we, children of the Lord. So rise and shine and give God the glory. When I'm in my best mornings, I can roll out of bed and as the sun's coming in the shutters, I say, give God the glory, give God the glory. Gloomy days, it's harder to do that. I don't have the visual aid to remind me. And most of us, when we get up in the day, it's hardly, Lord, praise you another day. It's like, oh, what I got to do? Oh, my, what time is, oh, I got to see. Oh, the traffic. <laughs> we get so distracted in serving Christ. But nevertheless, notice those who are eagerly awaiting Jesus. This is their blessing. Once more in Hebrews 10, in verse 10, Hebrews 10.10, we're told, by the will of God, we have been, you and I in Christ, have been set apart, sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus, hapox, once for all time. Doesn't have to happen again. The joy of the resurrection doesn't have to happen in a different way. God doesn't have any other plan. 
And later on, you know we're going to be reading the letters of Peter, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude. Jude even uses this in his third verse when he said, you know, I'm just going to write to you about the salvation Jesus provided, but because already the faith is being undermined, I am writing to you that you will contend, hopox, once for all, for the faith delivered to the saints. And we'll get to that more when we get to Jude. But the fact is, this is a great word, and... If I ever had a pox on my house, I would like a hop art <laughs> so that I would always know that once for all, Christ has done this. A realistic expectation in the world back here was that we should be treated nicely and well being good citizens and faithful neighbors, but if not, we serve Christ because he himself, our substitution, he died once for all for the sins of the many. And that includes us. And notice then, as we get from that great verse, 1 Peter 3, 18, suddenly everything gets murky. We're reading this. Christ also suffered once for all for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight people, were brought safely through water. The eight people, of course, were Mr. and Mrs. Noah and Noah's three sons and their wives. That's eight. They were brought through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This passage is so great that it's a part of the difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches of the Reformation. The idea of purgatory or second chance salvation is lined up with this passage because of the way it's read. The idea that limbo might exist for babes or others that are, quote, innocent, who was born innocent. But nevertheless, this is the way the circumstance rests. I want to tell you, I have read so many commentaries with the most fanciful things about what this passage is supposed to say and how baptism saves. You know, a Roman Catholic believes that if you baptize a child before it dies, as often happened when midwives were allowed to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that would save them from what? Their original sin. I've never heard a Catholic not express to me when I ask, well, what does baptism do? Well, it washes away our original sin. Like, there's something in our hearts, but somehow God takes it out of it, and then, and then we live on a system of merits and demerits. That's not in this passage, but that's what's derived from it. And there are many other things. Baptism is regenerational, as some of the Anglicans of old time used to hold. Your baptism and it saves you. That isn't what it says. So I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, let's do what Jesus would have done as he did as we heard in the sermon today, where he opens the scriptures to them. And let's see what the text does not say. There are some others, of course, who are saying, yeah, this passage tells us that when Jesus was dead, he descended to hell and he preached to people that somehow were contained and then when he evangelized them, they were set free and, and saved. Doesn't say that either, but let's try to keep our fantasies on one side and, and get well for the other. Okay, what does the text not say? It does not say Christ who was put to death in the flesh descended. We put that in there because we know the Apostles' Creed that we said this morning or that you'll say in the service coming up. It doesn't say Jesus descended. What's it say? He went, which means directly from a point of understanding to a destination that's marked out. Jesus didn't go to some downward 
circumstance. He did not descend. He went to the spirits in prison. Secondly, it doesn't say he went to humans. It said he went to spirits. And Paul and Peter both use the idea of spirit as those angels, powers, principalities, such as Ephesians has already shown us as we're following with Pastor Walker's theory. It's in Colossians. It's in Thessalonians. It reminds us that there's a, the real world, the real visible world that you and I live in is not the whole. It's only a half like the orange split open. There's a whole world of spirit interaction. We read this again and again. Even Jesus, speaking about seeing Satan fall, doesn't give us the time measurement, but it tells us spiritual conflict is part of the real world. The real world is both seen and unseen. Don't we say that in the Nicene Creed? I believe in God, the maker of all things visible and invisible, spirits, powers, and principalities. So it isn't saying that when Jesus died, he went down to hell and he preached to human beings. It says he preached to what? Spirits. Ah, the third one. It does not say Jesus, when he died, went to hell. Now remember, there are two words for hell in the New Testament. One is Gehenna, which was the burning garbage dump that was never unburning outside Jerusalem. And Jesus said the gnashing and the pain and the if only regret that's going to be in hell because you knew you should have come to Christ. You knew something was wrong. But you refused because you wanted your way of life. You wanted to have your fun. This is what he used. The Greeks also had a place they called Tartarus, which meant a place of punishment and sorrow. But the hell, he descended into hell of the Apostles' Creed, is actually the word hage, which just means a place of the dead. Doesn't have any moral penalty necessarily attached to it. And it's the word that in the Hebrew was sheol. Now, in sheol, if you read the Psalms, it's very clear. Sheol is like a place that's somehow under the earth and sees all that's going on. But once you're there, you can't do anything to influence the world there. So we read certain Psalms that say, Lord, Please heal me is what the gist is. Because if I die, how can I praise you from Sheol? How can we have any influence in the world if we're dead and can only see what's there? That same sense is in Hebrews 12.1. Seeing that we are surrounded, now this is a stadium picture, by a great cloud of witnesses who have already testified to Jesus and lived and died for him. So, this crowd of witnesses that we're before is a place where they can't influence us, but they can watch us. So, what we're saying is not that Jesus died and went to hell, or even went to Hades. It says, what? He went to prison. And that's quite different. This is a term is never used regarding the place of the dead. It means a place of captivity. Whatever in the plan of God was going on from Old Testament days, we cannot quite put our finger on and say, well, that's that. But there are some illusions that tell us it was in the days of Noah. So when you want to find Noah, where do you go? You go to Genesis 6 to 9. And in Genesis 6, we read that in those days, the sons of God... We don't know who those are, but they are divine beings of some kind. Had eyes for the beautiful daughters of human beings and wanted them. And they were forbidden to do so by the word of God, but they went ahead and disobeyed that word and somehow came to live and intermarry with them. And sexually, technically, they produced a group of people called the Nephilim. That's plural, always in the Hebrew. <clears throat> Lots of nephils. <laughs> a Nephilim. And they always had the idea of being taller than most humans. They were considered giants in the earth. 
When you get to the book of Numbers, you see Caleb and Joshua going in and saying, come on, we'll take the land. And the other ten guys are saying, are you nuts? Did you see the people? We saw the Nephilim there. We're like grasshoppers compared to their tallness and their height and their, their build. We can't do it. Let's not. We're dead if we do. So Numbers 13.33 is a reminder also that the Nephilim were somehow descendants that a human race, in part of the human race, there was this group of people. And what we basically could understand as we get to the last one, does it say he preached? It does in most of our translations, which is a dubious thing, because when we think about preaching, we think about euangelizolo, evangelizing, and that's what we're saying. Jesus came and he preached, believe in me and I'll get you out of here. It doesn't say that he evangelized, even though it says preached. He used the word keruso, which means a strong, a firm declaration. This is it. And if he declared, you were told not to do this, you have been held to this time that I will show you I can conquer sin and death. And somehow, in the work of God, this is the best explanation I can give you. I'm not saying it's right or infallible, but it's as close to sticking to the text. It's saying when Christ died, in spirit, he was alive. And he went and he said, I told you, and now your condemnation is sealed because I have conquered sin and death. And those who were held, if you notice back in reading Genesis 6 and 7, were somehow held in subjection till God wanted to do. That was God's plan to do for them and because of what he did to the human race. So it's hard to say, are there Nephilim running around the day? I don't know. There, there are not very many tall people in Israel when I had been there. Doesn't mean there aren't. But what I mean is, I don't know, does Israel have a basketball team yet? I'm not sure. But obviously... <laughs> And men are basically where Caleb and, and Joshua were, shorter, frailer looking. So I hope this helps you understand that if you stick to the text, as Jesus says, what does it say? It at least gives us this, and we can find some of the clues. In the Old Testament, there's an apocryphal book we do not use. It's in the Catholic Bible called First Enoch. And there's a fair amount of chapters that go on talking about this same Genesis 6 problem of God setting apart and condemning those who intermarried humans and the sons of God, fallen sons of God, demons in a sense, although not demonic. Like when we think of demon, we always have a negative evil aspect. Here it's talking about spirits that just belong to God and wouldn't do and as Satan himself fell from heaven, so did they in their time. Now, the last one is more difficult, again, about baptismal regeneration or washing away some sort of original sin. I'm not sure how you can wash away your human nature if we believe God about what sin is. I love this verse 21 and on. Formerly in the days, this is verse 20, these spirits, again, did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared at which eight people were brought out. How long did it take to build Noah's ark? Does anybody know? It was close to 100 years in terms of the reading of whose age was what age as you get through 6 through 9. So it isn't as though God was unfair and unjust by making some people drown because they didn't listen. Maybe they just, you know, weren't in the neighborhood at the time. Look, you and I have seen Lancaster change over 100 years. I think that's plenty of time that people would know and hear, even about sort of the strange people. It says here in verse 21... Baptism, which corresponds to this. To what? Going back to verse 20. Eight people were brought safely through water. 
Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience. Where's this come from? Through the resurrection of Jesus Messiah, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to them. So when you read that, you say, oh yeah, baptism saves. See, the water saves you if you're baptized. Well, that isn't what it says. It says that no one his family were saved through the water, not by the water. What saved? What saved Noah and his family? We don't have any diligent scholars today. The ark. It was the ark that kept them, and they were safely brought through the water. Doesn't that make sense? Baptism here is not the sacrament of baptism, as your mind just flips to when it says baptism is corresponding to that. What is baptism in the early church? What is baptism as a new Christian? What is baptism when Peter calls 3,000 to repent and trust the Messiah? Baptism is the function, I would say, not the sacrament. And baptism was this. What do we do, Peter? Says the book of Acts. Repent. Change your mind. Believe God's message. Jesus is bearing your sin. He has a sinless life and transfers his righteousness to you. He died in your place that you don't have to bear that penalty. He did this as a substitution, as a vicarious atonement to bring you back to God. So change your mind. Quit living to yourself. Believe God about the need of your human nature, what it really is a fault at, and get right with God. Then, 3,000 believed and were baptized. Baptism didn't save them. Baptized affirmed their confession and repentance. And as we heard even in the sermon this morning, it's exactly what Repentance. It's what Pastor Walker brought at the end of the sermon. To believe in Christ is not just to believe you can be the Son of God. Yeah, God can do anything He wants to. He can make any being He wants. That's not what believing in Jesus is about. Believing in Jesus is saying, I'm going to trust your promise that if I come to you, you will change my nature. You, over time indeed, will continue to help me keep short accounts with you and change my life so that I'm looking more like him and less like what I was. Thank God, said the man, I'm not what I used to be, Lord. I'm not what I want to be, Lord. But thanks be to you. I'm not what I was, Lord. All right. Baptism is the sign of a good conscience, it says. An oath or confession made before God. That's what it says. It tells us that just as Noah and his family were saved by the ark through the water, which was the symbol of death and destruction and annihilation, so Jesus is our ark who carries us through the condemnation and death and destruction that will face every human being who does not turn to God and say, I want to be yours. I want to be in your kingdom. But more than that, I want to say thank you to the Lord Jesus for what he's done for me. So I put this before you today and say that the appeal of a good conscience is saying, Lord, as well as I know myself and as best and honest as I can be, I do confess that my nature needs changing, that I am indeed going to change my mind and think after your thoughts. That's why I'm going to be here in First Peter and reading what you have to tell me about my nature and what Jesus has done for me. Thanks be to God. So this is what we are doing as we come today, remembering that as Christ rose from the dead on this Easter Sunday that we commemorate, Christ is the ark of my safety for whatever dangers and toils and snares face me. I am safe in the ark that will get me through the waters. Isn't that where you want to be? Join me as we pray. Merciful and great Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior, all the bliss that we possess 
is derived from your stained cross. We, to God, have by your blood been reconciled and made at peace with him. Now, Lord, your righteousness is found to be our salvation's only ground. So, here's all our felicity, Lord, that causes us to live now and eternally. Thank you for your great love and sacrifice. Thank you for your great power and resurrection as we rejoice this day in you and the safety of being in you, our ark. Amen and amen. So be it.